front of the cloud. All right, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Butterfly Gardening in Florida. This webinar is going to be hosted by myself, Tia Silvesi. I'm the Florida-friendly landscaping agent in Orange County, and also um, Tina McIntyre, who is the Florida-friendly landscaping agent in Seminole County. So we're going to be sharing information relevant to um, Butterfly Garden in Central Florida, also the state of Florida, and really like the whole Southeast or some of these uh, concepts apply to people joining us uh, worldwide. Like some of these species are the same species of, of milkweed or whatever plants, you know, the same as here as in Hawaii or elsewhere in the world. So um, just to get started, I wanted to let you know that this is part of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And these are our nine guiding principles that help us make environmentally friendly decisions in our home landscapes. It can also be in commercial landscapes. So Florida Friendly is a UF IFAS program, University of Florida, in uh, partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection. And so this is really a landscaping program disguised as a water quality program, because one of the main goals is to protect our environmental resources and our water quality by choosing appropriate landscaping techniques, plants, watering, fertilizer, and that way we are helping the environment. Um, the butterfly gardening class today is really going to focus on principle number five, which is to attract wildlife. And, you know, when we bulldoze the native forest and, you know, plan our housing developments, a lot of the species are lost that are, you know, um, habitat, food, places to live for these butterflies. And so it's kind of our duty, our responsibility to be a good steward of the environment and plant some of these plants back in our environments, um, especially our urban environment. You know, we can make a, a huge butterfly garden. So um, back to the importance of creating habitat for the butterflies. You know, we build on uh, kind of clear cut areas and some neighborhoods in Florida look like this, where it's just a lot of houses and a lot of lawns and a lot of roads, a lot of rooftops, but not a whole lot of trees and plants and flowers and other things that are going to support butterflies and other pollinators in beneficial insects. So the biggest thing that we can do to support the butterflies is to pro provide them lots of flowers. And flowers contain um, nectar and pollen for pollinators. And they also are the larval host plants, which in um, layman's terms is what the caterpillars eat. And so that's how you can really attract the butterflies and beneficial insects and remember that even though you're just one little homeowner or maybe you rent or maybe you live in an apartment and just have a pot of flowers that is good for the butterflies, we can all make a difference. And you'll see that if you kind of join together as a community and make it a priority, then we can kind of do a more like community butterfly scaping and the butterflies will have lots of different houses because everyone's providing a little bit of love for the butterflies. So um, some basics of creating habitat for butterflies is that we wanna have a variety of flowering plants. We wanna plant both nectar and larval host plants. So larval host plants, that's what the caterpillar is gonna eat. And then the nectar plants is what the um, adult butterflies and other bees and hummingbirds and pollinators are going to, you know, get the, the sweet nectar out of the flower. And it can include natives and it can also include non-natives like Florida friendly plants do include both natives and non-natives. But um, the native plants are important because some of the butterflies only eat native plants, some of the caterpillars. And so it's important to include some of those key species of native plants. And if you're not um, from Florida, you can find out what are the key species of native plants for butterflies 
in your area. And then most of these flowers do like sun or partial sun, but you can find plants for shade. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But just in this picture here, you can see that purple in the very front, that's a purple salvia, or some people call it like a blue sage. And that's an excellent pollinator plant. We see bees and butterflies, all kinds of things on it. In the um, top left corner, that kind of pink purple plant, that's a fire spike. And that's a perennial shrub. It gets to like five or six feet tall. And that's a great plant for butterflies and hummingbirds and other pollinators. And then also the red bottle brush is here in bloom in the, in the top right. So another excellent plant for pollinators. One thing about butterflies and pollinators in general is that they love color. So we have some different pictures of some plants here and you want to plant, you know, a lot of colorful things together so they get that big boom and when they're flying by they can really hone into your garden rather than just having a sporadic plant here or there, but every little bit helps. So even if you just have one plant, then that will be uh, beneficial. Um, on the left side, we have Coreopsis, and this is uh, many species of Coreopsis. Um, our native Coreopsis, which is our state wildflower, is all yellow. Um, so this is maybe not the native Florida one, but it might be native to Texas or something. But all the Coreopsis do great in our Florida gardens. Um, in the middle is that red flower, the blanket flower, and that's the Gallardia also known as Gallardia. This is another one that, you know, both of these are in the Asteraceae family and they're known for just being pollinator magnets. And they have that big center and we call that the butterfly landing pad. So like zinnias, coreopsis, blanket flowers, they all have that big butterfly landing pad. So look for flowers like that. Um, some other um, native plants here, the horseman in the top right, and the firebush, which is a shrub pictured in the bottom right. So these are all um, good colors that the butterflies are attracted to. Um, butterflies see in ultraviolet light. So this kind of picture is pretty cool. And it just shows you, you know, if you were a butterfly and you were flying around the environment, this is what the flowers would look like to you. So you can see, especially those landing pads in the middle is a very bright, you know, colorful spot for the butterfly's eyesight, which is in ultraviolet light. So the most important thing about attracting butterflies is to plant the right larval host plants. And what I mean by that is the plant that the butterfly is going to lay its eggs on. So you can see this is the monarch butterfly and it's laying its eggs on this milkweed plant right on the underside of the leaf. So the egg, you can see it with your naked eye and it's just a little tiny little yellowish dot. Um, and then it makes a very tiny caterpillar that eats and eats and eats and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it's kind of the big fat caterpillar that we see, you know, you, but you can look carefully to see the small ones. And then um, after the caterpillar has its fill, then it will turn into that J shape and then it will do its metamorphosis and like turn into the chrysalis and then get ready to hatch and then emerge as the new adult butterfly. So if you want monarchs in your garden, then you have to plant this milkweed for it to lay its eggs and for the caterpillar to eat it. So we're gonna go in this um, process in detail next with about 10 of the most common butterflies that we see here in Florida. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tina now to take this part of the webinar and describe to you a little bit more about the butterflies and what larval host plants to plant to attract each specific um, butterfly. Thanks, Tia. And yeah, you know, we have um, had a lot of urbanization in our state. And when the Spaniards first came to Florida, they named it La Florida, 
the flowering, you know, it's, it's of the flower. And so we want to replace those flowers in our yards, you know, those that were lost to development. And um, I also want to take a quick second to address a question in the chat and the Q&A um, about invasive species. So we are going to cover um, non-native, a few non-native and mostly native species that the different butterflies depend on. And um, it's okay to plant non-native Florida-friendly species Florida friendly, we never recommend invasive species. Um, the bottle brush, as Tia mentioned, and I see in the chat, is one that is kind of confusing. So there's two species, um, one's a Melaleuca, and um, there's another one. And one of them, the Melaleuca species, is modeled by UF to, to seem invasive. And so um, you really have to know which species you have, but um, so that's just a detail where we're, I think, working out, um, to say the least, as invasive species can be complicated, but um, all, everything we're talking about here is Florida friendly and mostly native. So let's get started with the monarch butterfly. Larval host plants for this butterfly include Asclepias, various forms of milkweed species. So Asclepias is our botanical or binomial scientific name, and um, whatever genus you're selecting would be specific to that plant. There are over 20 species of native milkweeds in Florida. A lot of them, like my virtual background, do like around aquatic areas. Monarchs are the only butterflies that migrate north annually, and they have quite a range. So you can see here, of course, this is the one we're all most familiar with, right, the monarchs. And here down at the bottom, that's the milkweed. Next slide, please. So just giving you a quick highlight of some of those really great milkweed species, we have the swamp milkweed, which is Asclepias incarnata, Yep, it's right there on the left. It's a light pink um, to white, depending on you know where you see it in nature. And this is available for sale commercially. Now, if it's called small swamp milkweed, you probably want to plant it in a wet area, um, hence the swamp. And then also you can plant it in a pot that doesn't have holes is another way to kind of get around that. And we also have butterfly milkweed. Now this is not the tropical milkweed. We'll get there on the next slide. This is Asclepias tuberosa. So there's no red in the, the flower um, petals. It's just all orange. And this tends to like it a little bit more dry. So you will see that when you're hiking around a pine flatwoods type area. So it would be appropriate for a high and dry yard. And then of course we have the aquatic milkweed. And again, aquatic, Check out the background. We're looking lakeside. We're looking close to wetlands, depression areas in your yard that are wet. Um, and it can be wet seasonally. It doesn't have to be always wet because these plants are very adaptive. And that's the Asclepias perineus. Now for these milkweeds, the caterpillars, the reason why they're so important is because the caterpillar is going to eat the leaves, but it's not gonna kill the plant, right? It might look like a stick when it's done to go into, when it's ready to go into its chrysalis, but it's going to allow that plant to continue to bloom. So when that butterfly hatches miraculously, comes out of its chrysalis, and it becomes an adult butterfly, that nectar, that flower will still be there for the butterfly to enjoy. So they're very smart in that way. Now, talking a little bit about this tropical milkweed, this is a non-native species. It is uh, not invasive, but we do recommend that you cut it back in December um, in Central Florida. And that's because we want those monarchs to migrate to Mexico. And that's where this plant is naturally native to, is native to Mexico. And so I know for me, I cut mine back in around Thanksgiving, you know, November, December, cut back all these plants and they're starting to come back. They're starting to, to leaf out again, and they will come back. They're perennials, they have a, a taproot. And so don't worry about cutting it back. They will come back in spring. They're very easy to grow. They do self seed, or you can grow it from cut, cutting. And it again, grows year round, but you wanna avoid those December blooms to allow those monarchs to you know, avoid our freezes. I heard a 
30s in Central Florida this weekend. So we don't want the butterflies hanging out around that those cold days because it will kill them. And it also uh, helps us prevent the persistence of a OE protozoan parasite. So this is actually a sexually transmitted disease among butterflies that is a problem. So they get it sexually and, you know, when they're mating and then it hurts them in a way that it's a parasite as they're gestating, they're um, changing from a caterpillar to a butterfly, their wings actually develop inappropriately. And so when they come out, they can't fly. Um, I've seen it in my own yard. And so again, that's really important that we take it down to the ground in late uh, in the year to kind of just use it during the summer and um, allow it to come back in spring. <clears throat> yeah, some people say like Thanksgiving time is a good time to cut them back. Yep. And so giant milkweed. Now this is another non-native, however, it's Florida friendly. So it's okay. It's not going to, you know, become invasive and hurt our uh, wetlands and things like that. This is giant milkweed. It's native to Asia and Africa. It's easy to grow from cutting. It has a pretty waxy, almost drought tolerant feel to it. Um, so it is pretty water wise. And it's a large perennial. So this is not one that's going to get, you know, yay big, waist high. It is going to get pretty sizable, um, but it can be a little cold sensitive. So if you have it and you're seeing a freeze in the forecast, this is one that you would want to cover with some frost cloth or blankets. And Tia also wrote a great blog on this. So check it out with your QR code here, um, or you can always subscribe to her blog and get more information there. Okay, our next butterfly is the Gulf fr Fritillary. Uh, say that five times fast, right? Yeah, right. It's pictured up there at the top. It's orange and you can see the caterpillar is kind of a cool, it looks like some kind of armored uh, football player or something. Has that orange stripe down the side, really black um, and really spiky. So these are basically, it's telling any birds or other things, I'm toxic, don't eat me. Um, and so it's able to persist to adulthood. The larval host plants and species for the Gulf literary includes the Passiflora species. And so whatever um, species and in, in, in that genus is going to be good. Um, Passiflora incarnata is one of my favorites. It is a Florida native. It's the pur purple passion flower. Um, sometimes those under petals are purple. Other times they're white. So there's a little variation there, but it is does get a pretty sizable, uh, maybe the size of an, an orange, like a navel orange or so. Um, and they're beautiful and they smell great and the leaves are great. And so the caterpillar is again going to eat those leaves. And then the adult is going to nectar from this flower. Um, the adult is gonna lay those eggs on the underside of the leaf. And so if you plant that incarnata, you're gonna see the flutterary here in central Florida. We also have the corky stemmed passion flower or Passiflora suberosa. Um, that's the one here in the middle. Um, you can see that uh, tendril that's just winding. And that is why it's called the corky stem. So those tendrils are a vine's way of grabbing onto things and help it lock into, um, to grow, to be able to hang on to things. So kind of a cool little, little thing, but again, the flower is a little bit more diminutive. It's not as big, but man, this, you would never know that this plant is, it's kind of the shy one in the corner. It's not going to take over the yard but it will attract those butterflies. And then finally, the Passiflora lutea or the yellow passion flower. This one's a little less known. I would say a little less common maybe at our nurseries, um, but again, a, a great bang for your buck in terms of getting those butterflies into your yard and picking the right species. The sulfur butterfly. These are really pretty common around our Floridian coasts, but they can be seen throughout our pine flatwoods and our various ecosystems here in the central part of the state. 
Larval host plants for the sulfur butterfly include our Fabaceae or our pea and bean family. Okay, so that's the kind of scientific name of saying pea family or Fabaceae family. Um, legumes or nitrogen fixing plants. And so really they're gonna be kind of interested in any type of bean or, you know, but particularly they like sennas. And so if you plant this um, various types of senna species, you're gonna probably see the sulfur butterfly. So we have the sen uh, senna lugastrina, the privet wild sensitive plant. And so this one, I think I believe it's called sensitive because it does kind of change. So in the heat of the day, it's gonna kind of like have a wilty look and then come back to life. And um, it's got those uh, pinnate leaves. And um, of course, again, these are gonna be all fixing nitrogen. Nitrogen is something that is great for your garden. And so you definitely wanna be planting beans and legumes. We have Senna um, Maralandica, which is the Maryland wild Senna. And that has a little bit more of a broad leaf. And then finally, the Sema, Senna obtusifolia, sorry, tongue twisters today, <laughs> and the sickle pod. So uh, various types of Sennas are gonna be great. And again, the caterpillars are gonna be eating the leaves. So don't freak out, you know, this is why we plant butterfly plants. <clears throat> we have, like Tia said, we have our ornamental foliage species, our coonties and our other things that are green all year and that's great, but the butterfly area is one place that we really wanna be accepting that we're not gonna have the most beautiful foliage because we're, that's the point, right? Our caterpillars are eating away those leaves, coming back to enjoy the nectar as adults. That's right, great point, Tina. Excellent. So. Um, and then don't confuse the Senna's with our Sesbanias, just as a quick note as I eyeball the chat real quick. Sesbanias is an invasive and um, not one that we would recommend. So um, just a quick note on that. They kind of look similar. Okay, and the swallowtail. So some butterflies are very specific, like monarchs want milkweed, done. Gulf areas really want the passion flower, that's it. Swallowtails are really more opportunistic about how they exist and what they're willing to eat um, as you know, humans are, right? Some of us really want different things and are picky and others are kind of more opportunistic. So um, the swallowtail is an example of an opportunistic butterfly. Uh, there are 10 species of swallowtails in Florida and there are a variety of larval host plants. We have wild lime. Now, if you are in a close quarters, an urban area or um, along a path or something, wild lime might not be the best plant because it does get thorns. So you wanna be careful with that one. Um, it's a great native plant, but I would plant it kind of more in the back um, off beaten trail type of a thing. Citrus plants. Swallowtail butterflies really like to eat citrus leaves. And again, um, actually T and I are working on a new EDIS publication, Rethinking Wildlife in Your Florida Friendly Edible Landscape. If you wanna get oranges, you know, you probably still can get oranges even if the swallowtail is eating a few of your leaves. So, you know, that's kind of one of those, what's your goal? Are we going edible? Are we going butterfly? Or maybe we can exist somewhere in the middle. Wild cherry. Uh, magnolias and our other beautiful bay species that love aquatic areas, the tulip tree, pond apple. So for those of you in South Florida, uh, pond apple is a great Florida native of our Florida Everglades, a uh, fantastic aquatic plant that the swallowtails love. And it does produce really interesting little flowers and fruits. Um, so if you're in South Florida along a water area, consider pond apple. Pawpaws, another fruiting native Florida plant. Um, those grow throughout the state, I believe. And then our herb garden. So if you plant an herb garden with parsley, dill, fennel, and again, you have those swallowtails chomping down, maybe you just plant an extra for them. And that's the compromise that we're having this, these beautiful pollinators that are gonna help our crops, help our um, biodiversity of our landscape, and, and kind of create that balance. 
in our landscapes and gardens. And so a little bit more about that swallowtail. So we have the giant swallowtail, which is here on the left. It's the largest butterfly in Florida. And there are other orange dog caterpillars that feed on citrus. So again, just a little bit more about that citrus. If you see something that looks like a bird poop, it probably is uh, that larval stage of the giant swallowtail. And it's time to get excited because it's the citrus has lots of bad things on it, right? Like greening and canker and all those things. But, you know, this one is one that we would want to um, kind of foster and allow. And you can see it here. I believe it's feeding on one of our native lupines. Oh, I cannot, I got to get out and hike this spring to see the lupines. Tia, those are one of my favorites. Yeah, they're beautiful. And zebra long wings. So zebra long wings is one of our, it's actually our native Florida state butterfly. So um, as it's our state butterfly, somebody, you know, in history, they said, this is, this is it. This is really unique to our state. We want this to be recognized. And so we should all as interested people in plants and butterflies, think about planting stuff for the zebra long wing. And a lot of the things that we would turn to for the zebra long wing are also going to be those same species that benefit our Gulf lidiaries. So the Passiflora genus, the Incarnata, the Superosa, that corky stem one. And it's true. So I have both of, I have actually three varieties, three species of Passiflora in my yard. And I can tell you that they do absolutely. I get the flitieries and the long wings. So those are great um, additions. And then you can see the, the caterpillar is very different you know, white with these black uh, spikes and dots. So very different looking from the Gulf Lidiri, obviously. <clears throat> yeah, that's a kind of funny looking one, but that's easy to identify. Exactly. And the Buckeye butterfly. So the larval hosts for this are gonna be the false fox love they kind of tend to like the purple spectrum. So you can see here, we have lots of different things. We have the twin flower. So that's the one right there in the middle. Um, those blooms look kind of big on the picture, but keep in mind that they're no bigger than the size of a dime, very tiny. And that's a fantastic Florida friendly ground cover. So if you're looking for something for either a dry or a wet areas, there's two species of twin flower and um, they're really fantastic for ground cover, erosion control, and butterflies. So definitely twin flower is a highlight, I would say. Ruelia carolinensis. This is our Carolina wild petunia and um, our native Florida petunia and Ruelia. Um, definitely recommended over our uh, invasive Ruelia. We don't want to be planting that one. And um, it's a lot more diminutive and it does like it kind of shady. So just keep that in mind if you're going to try to grow Aurelia. And then the Plantago, the Plantago lanceolata, the Indian plantain. Now this is something that you might see in your turf as a weed. Um, but again, weed and nuisance plant is very subject subjective. And so if you have Plantago lanceolata, you might consider leaving it for the buckeye blood butterflies as their host plant. So they're gonna be eating those leaves and nectaring from the flowers. Yep, that's right. In my landscape, that is a butterfly host plant and not considered a weed. That's right. All right, thank you, Tina. Great introduction to um, the butterflies and what to plant for their larval host plants. I'm gonna transition now into you know, how to get started with your butterfly garden and how to do it in a Florida friendly way. So the first thing you wanna do is pick your site. You want a sunny site, an area with full or partial sun. You can do butterfly gardens in the shade, but you just have to be more selective on your species that you choose. Um, it doesn't have to be viewable from your house. But um, you might enjoy looking out your kitchen window and, 
you know, seeing some butterflies out in the yard, or maybe your kids or grandchildren like to go outside and check on the undersides of the leaves to see if there's any caterpillars for a fun activity. Um, you want access to water because a lot of these butterfly plants are Florida friendly and drought tolerant, but you will need to water them in to get them established. And during periods of drought, like we're coming up into our dry season right now in March, April and May here in Florida, which kind of corresponds with our spring planting season. So be sure to keep an eye on your plants and water them as needed. And it's best to have like a little block of land. So you can just have one or two plants here or there, but if you can put a 10 by 10 block of area together and have that be your butterfly garden and plant the flowers in, in masses so it's really bright and colorful, that will help to attract the butterflies in. So then after you pick, you know, the location of your site, then make your design. So in some of the pictures that we've shown in this kind of diagram here, we have the layers. So we have large plants, we have smaller plants, um, we have ground covers. And so the butterflies like multiple layers and that's good for any type of wildlife habitat. Also groupings of plants. So maybe buy like three of everything or 10 of everything and put them together in a clump because these clumps of color are really gonna attract in the butterflies and other pollinators. And you can use this design in a small garden or you can you know, kind of repeat it and plant different things and put it around your whole yard, around the perimeter of your yard or a big island or you know, around every tree. So really the possibilities are endless, but the, the most important thing is your plant selection. So um, Tina went over the larval host plants here. These are the ones that the caterpillars are gonna eat. So these are, make sure you get, you know, one of each of these or a couple of these, you know, a couple different types of milkweed, uh, at least one species of passion flower, some of the senna or the things in the pea family with the yellow flowers for that sulfur butterfly. And then some wild petunias, those are easy. Um, the bay trees and frog fruit as the, the ground cover. Um, that was for, um, I think the um, peacock butterfly likes the frog fruit and it's uh, hosts for other butterflies too. So these are what the caterpillars are gonna eat, these larval host plants. So start with you know a couple of those for your foundation and then add a lot of nectar plants, as many as you can. I'm gonna go over these in a little bit more detail here, but things like the butterfly bush, um, zinnias, gallardias, the, the coreopsis or the tick seed, uh, marigolds are great, lantana, um, the native species or the Florida friendly species of lantana, not the exotic invasive species, and the porter weed, which there's a native Florida porter weed that's more low growing, there's a larger porter weed. And so plenty of nectar plants. And I'm gonna go into these a little bit more details here, kind of based on the plant habit. So the annuals are things that you can start from seed and they're gonna grow quickly. For example, these cosmos and zinnias started from seed. They'll come up in about um, you know, a week or two and they'll be blooming within two months. You'll be able to get blooms on these that you start from seed. So that's one of the cheap and easy ways. A marigold is also easy from seed. The, the coreopsis, which is our state wildflower, um, those do good from seeds. The blanket flower or gallardia, um, the phlox and the black eyed Susan. So you can just mix all these seeds together or get like a Florida wildflowers pack of seeds and plant the seeds. You know, the best time for planting here in Florida is like the fall, like around October 1st or the spring, like at March 1st. So we're at the perfect timing and a cheap and easy way to start a butterfly garden is just to fluff up the soil and get a pack of each of these seeds and mix them together and, and plant them out in the ground, water them in, you know, water them to establishment and you'll have some blooms in no time.
Um, so some perennials are a really great choice for like a longer term butterfly garden. Um, they will live for many months, hopefully many years. Um, some of the shrubs and trees live for, you know, multiple years or decades, but some perennials like um, the pentas here, the white pentas in the middle, they might just live for like one or two seasons, but still you get a lot of bang for your buck, you know, you can buy these in a little four inch pot or one gallon and it will bloom and live all summer long into the winter, you know, maybe until we get a, a frost. Um, so some of these include salvia, um, the pentas, the white pentas here, um, lantanas, the, the bush daisy, the yellow bush daisy, um, milkweeds, perennial nectar plants. Um, you know, milkweed is a double duty plant because it's the larval host plant and the flowers provide nectar too. Um, that porter weed, um, the African blue basil that's pictured here in the top right hand corner, and that gets a ton of flowers. You'll see bees all over it. And the bulbine is another, you know, pollinator friendly, like succulent plant. It's used for kind of a, a ground cover, kind of like a liriope. And it's just covered with flowers for uh, most of the year. So that's a real water wise choice, that bulbine. And it doesn't get too big either. There are many, many salvias. And I wanted to point out this native red salvia. Because if you are, have a butterfly garden in the shade, or you want to plant some um, pretty flowers in the shade, then this is one of the things that you want to choose right here is this native red salvia. You can get it at native plant nurseries. Um, you can go to fann.org and find, you know, native plant nursery near you. And the salvia coccinea. Um, other salvias also do good in partial shade to um, full shade to full sun. And a lot of them are long lived and easy to propagate. So definitely add some salvias and some sages to your garden. Um, for shrubs, shrubs are, are very Florida friendly because they will live for multiple years. Um, they often don't need a lot of pruning and they are great, you know, butterfly um, nectar and uh, pollen, you know, factory. So some of the things pictured here is that purple Mexican sage in the front center. Um, we have the yellow thyralis in the, in the left. Um, which isn't that great of a butterfly plant, but it looks pretty. So it's good to add anyway. Um, in the pink Jatropha in the back here with those hot pink flowers. And then in the very back is that fire bush, the Florida native fire bush or the cultivar of the native, which is the dwarf fire bush. Um, those are good. Also the butterfly bush, um, the cassia, which can be a small shrub or a small tree. The, the purple or white plumbago, those are really good, drought tolerant. Um, the bottle brush, make sure you get the non-invasive kind. And the chase tree looks kind of like a butterfly bush. And those are really good with those big stalks of purple flowers. And then trees can also be um, butterfly nectar plants. You might not think of it, but um, you know, we have some trees that provide flowers, especially in the spring. There's a lot of flowering trees right now. And you can see in this picture here, we have the flatwoods plum, these two trees in the back. Um, in the center here, we have a little dwarf tipicina. And this front plant is that bulbine I was talking about. It's kind of a little succulent and it gets lots of flowers that have uh, pollen and nectar for pollinators. Um, some other good species include the native Florida fiddlewood, um, almond bush, it gets the spikes of white flowers, um, our Florida native coral bean, that's also good for the shade, and there's many more trees that can also work as pollinator plants, so don't limit yourself and try to get, you know, a little bit of each of these you know, annuals, perennials, shrubs, and trees. So you can have the good year round flowers that will support your butterflies um, throughout the year. 
And then don't forget about the vines too, especially if you want hummingbirds, um, this coral honeysuckle vine, the Lanacera sempervirens, this is an excellent choice. And it's one of the top plants that I see hummingbirds visit in our Florida landscape. Um, also the passion vines are good nectar plants. Um, some of the climbing asters, those are excellent nectar plants covered in um, cute little purple flowers or white flowers in the fall. And also the orange trumpet vine that that's usually kind of in the winter blooming. So be sure to plant some of these vines around your yard too to complete your um, butterfly garden and attract some hummingbirds too. Um, so just to wrap it up, I'm gonna give you a couple of Florida friendly landscaping um, finishing touches. So, you know, you, you get your plants, you prepare your site and you plant your plants and you water them in. And then after that, go ahead and buy a couple bags of mulch or you can get free mulch delivery from chipdrop.com um, and get add a two to three layer of mulch. We like the organic mulch in Florida Friendly. And what I mean by organic is like pine bark, uh, pine straw, like tree trimmer mulch here, like the utility mulch that's pictured here. Um, anything made from uh, trees, the Malaluca mulch, that's made from the recycled um, invasive species down in South Florida. We do not like rocks as mulch or rubber mulch because those are not organic and they're going to heat up the soil. They're going to stress out the plants and it won't be as good for the environment. Um, and then maintain your garden. So it's okay to you know, pick some deadhead or brown leaves off, but don't keep it too neat. Like sometimes you wanna let those flowers go to seed and the seed is not mature until there's brown seed heads. And then you can kind of get the seeds out and then cut it back. But you know, let a late nature take its place in a little way. And you know, not all your plants are gonna survive. So see what does well in your yard. You know, plant a couple in different places and find your little microclimates that each of the plants like and maybe move them around if you needed or replace them with a different species if that one's not doing well for you. So we also want to water efficiently, like we're trying to help the environment here by attracting the wildlife, but we need to be mindful of how much water that we're using too. So what we recommend for water conservation is to use low flow irrigation, and that could be something like this micro spray head. Um, you can buy like a little micro irrigation kit from like Mr. Landscaper or, you know, different types of brands like that um, at the hardware stores and stuff or online. And they just have a small spray that will cover, you know, a, a little area in your butterfly garden. Um, you can also use the um, efficient rotary heads pictured in the top right here. This is like a Hunter MP rotor head and this kind of stimulates rain versus the traditional like spray irrigation that um, wastes more water. So this is like slow and longer and the water will sink into the ground at a rate that the plants can really use it and absorb it. And um, don't be afraid to hand water. Like you don't need to have an irrigation system at all. You can use a hose with a shower nozzle or one of these um, irrigation um, spray heads and just turn it on for like half an hour and water it, you know, two times a week right now and get your garden established. And then you won't need to water in the summer when we get our summer rains. Um, also like install a rain barrel to catch some water or create a rain garden, like a little depression to hold some of that water. And then you can plant some of the water loving plants like that aquatic milkweed that we talked about earlier in those kind of more wet spots. So um, providing water for butterflies, like they don't drink out of uh, bird baths. 
So they can't drink from freestanding water like a pond or something. So the best thing to do is to provide a puddling station for them. And it's like a little saucer here and you can fill it with some sand and rocks and then they can just land in there and they will absorb some of those vitamins and nutrients in their, in their lakes and they'll be able to sip the water from that little puddle. So um, this is a great activity. You can do this with your kids in the summer um, when you're bored or setting up your spring garden. It's really easy to create one of these. You just buy one of those clay saucers and then you can add a little layer of um, sand in there, a little bit of compost. The compost is going to give it the nutrients that are helpful for the butterflies. And then place some pebbles on top, you know, which will be like a little landing pad for the butterflies so they can, you know, ease in gently. And then just keep it filled with water. It doesn't need to be um, totally full with water, but just keep it a little moist. Maybe put it next to, you know, one of your little like micro sprayers so it gets refilled every once in a while, or you can check on it by hand. And it's just a fun little thing to create this puddling station um, for butterflies in your garden. Another thing is a fertilizer. So we need to fertilize responsibly and your butterfly plants might like to get a little fertilizer to get established, but beware of the fertilizer ordinance in your area. Um, in Orange County, we have one that um, bans nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer between um, June 1st and September 30th. It's the same for Seminole County and many counties in Florida, but check on your local fertilizer ordinance and see what the rules are in your area because we don't want this fertilizer to end up in our water bodies. So um, another thing, just general common sense, like don't fertilize before heavy rains. We want that fertilizer to stay in the root zone of the plants and we don't wanna lose it. Um, in the water because it will carry those nutrients off and also pesticides. So pretty much don't use pesticides in your butterfly garden because even the organic sprays like the BT, they can kill the butterfly caterpillars. So it's okay to use that stuff in your vegetable garden if you have some caterpillars on your cucumbers or whatever, but don't use any sprays in your butterfly garden. And a lot of the plant, the pests that will come are really harmless and they don't really affect the plants too much. You'll see the yellow aphids growing on the milkweed. And if you just leave them alone, they're not gonna be a problem. And the ladybugs will actually come and eat those aphids so you're creating more of an ecological, you know, garden here by allowing those, you know, bugs to persist in making, you know, other um, creatures come and be part of your habitat, providing food for them, really like the ladybugs, they love to eat aphids. So no need to kill them with pesticides. They're not hurting the butterfly plants anyway. And um, this is a butterfly garden in Tampa, Florida. And you can see this beautiful um, purple lantana in the front here. They have some of the native coonties that are growing behind that for something that's evergreen. Um, here on the right hand side, that's a beach dune sunflower with the clusters of milkweed behind that and that little spiky um, silk floss tree. So just pack those um, plants in there and you will attract the butterflies. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, if everybody plants a little bit in their yard, then we can create um, what we call a community butterfly scaping. And it's a community effort to create habitat um, and plant plants that encourage um, butterfly, and, you know, just by providing the pollen and the nectar, the shelter and the nesting sites. So we have a full edis on this that you can find um, on the link here or by clicking the QR code. 
And I will be sending an email with these links after the class with the link to the recording too. And then we have this really cool app that is for butterfly gardening. So just Google FFL butterfly gardening app and you can find it here. Um, and then you can look for different plants. You know, you can look for shrubs, trees, annuals, perennials, and you can kind of make your own butterfly garden design. So this app has, um, kind of profiles of 62 butterflies in it and 190 butterfly plants. So definitely a lot more extensive information than we were able to cover today in this webinar. So check out that app and it is free and available online uh, or on an app as your phone. And um, lastly, please connect with us. Um, um, my name is Tia. I'm in Orange County. Tina is in Seminole County. Um, the Garden Florida Facebook page, um, that's my Facebook page. And the UF IFAS Extension Seminole County, um, that's a page that they use for the Seminole County office. Um, you can find uh, my upcoming events on the ocextension.eventbrite.com and um, we're also on Instagram and YouTube. And both myself and Tina have some excellent blogs on these topics. So you can just Google our name and like UF blogs. That's how you can find the, the giant milkweed article and other great articles. And so I just like to wrap it up now and thank you all for coming to our butterfly gardening webinar. I hope you have learned a lot. And please um, scan the QR code right now and take our brief survey, or we will put the link in the chat box. And if you could just take a minute and complete that survey and let our bosses know that we're doing a great job, or if you enjoyed the webinar, or if not, that would really help us out a lot to um, keep our jobs and keep bringing you this wonderful information. Yeah, awesome job, Tia. And I did see a quick comment in the chat about, you know, what if we're not in Orange or Seminole counties? Do we have Florida friendly landscaping? There is an extension office in every single county in Florida. They may or may not have some um, Florida friendly. So reach out to your local extension, visit their webpage, check them out. Some of them have really robust Florida friendly programs, others maybe not so much, but you can always encourage your politicians to create a program. That's how we all get started. Um, I also wanna share a really great EDIS publication that I authored last year called Concepts for Sustainable Landscape Mosaics. So a little bit about what Tia was talking about, us creating, working together to create that patchwork of ecosystems among the urban setting. I think it just muted me. Um, it's in the chat right now. And so definitely check that out, give it a read, learn more. It has bloom times for various Florida friendly plants that might bloom in the fall or the spring or maybe year round. It has how you can create pollinator themed landscapes and gardens. So a great supporting resource for this class. Um, and then again, I will also uh, rechat our link for the upcoming webinar on uh, March 29th, Native Plants. T and I are gonna be talking more about right plant, right place. So definitely um, register for that if you have not already done so. And we will see you then. Um, and then also complete the survey. It definitely helps us, like Tia said, just to demonstrate that our program is having an effect and that you have learned something and that you're inspired to get out there and plant for, for wildlife and attracting wildlife. Great, great links, Tina, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah well, so do we want to tackle some questions? Yeah, we have a, a couple minutes for questions. And if, if we don't get to your questions, feel free to email me here, tsilvesi at ufl.edu. And then I'll be sending out the link to the recording and these links that we're sharing after the class today. All right. So a couple of these we did talk about. Um, and then can you shred paper as mulch? Um, yes, you can, but I more put it in my worm bin. If you just put it outside, it might blow away. 
So you can kind of put it shredded paper as mulch, but then maybe put some regular mulch on top of it to weigh it down so it doesn't blow away. Yeah, I think it's probably best for the compost bin, um, you know, just that type of a thing. And then what about mulching with sprouts? So if you put the seeds down, you don't want to also mulch that area. That's a great question because if you're a teeny tiny little seed and you pop out and then there's a big piece of wood on top of you, yeah, it might not work out. Right. So Very you really want to waste. Best. Yeah, wait until you start to see little plants. And then once those plants start getting established, then you can go in and sprinkle some mulch in, which will really help um, the area. Mm -hmm. Best plants for containers with limited space and full sun. Tia, what do you think? All right, like any of those kind of small perennials, I would choose like the Pentas, the Black Eyed Susan, the, the Coreopsis, the Gallardia is doing great right now. That will bloom all summer long. Excellent. And then we have a follow-up question on the bottle brush. So if you haven't heard already, we have Plant This, Not That, our new book that came out last year in October which talks about invasive species. And it does have um, the specific information about bottle brush in there. So um, the Melaleuca vinimalis is the one that the UFIFAS in, um, assessment has deemed as an ecological threat in North, Central and South Florida. So if you are, if you have the Calistamon species, then you are probably okay. Um, and again, this is not, the UFIFS assessment is a predictive model-based tool. So it's not necessarily saying that bottle brush is invasive, it's that it has the potential to be invasive. And a lot of that has to do with that it's in the Melaleuca species um, genus or genus and uh, that it could spread. So there's a lot of other great, you know, things that we could, we could do if you're having a hard time identifying between the Callistamon and the Melaleuca. Um, so just to answer that one, and then um, how about one more, Tia, what do you think? Yeah, sure. That is going to be three o'clock right now. Yeah, so hiking to see lupines and places to go see butterflies, what do you think? Oh, well, there's multiple butterfly gardens across the state, like little nook and cranny ones, like I showed the one in um, Tampa, but up in Gainesville on the University of Florida campus is the History of Natural Museum, and they have one of the most spectacular um, butterfly gardens in the state, in my opinion. Also, locally, if you're in the Orlando area, Lucas Nursery has like a butterfly encounter and then you can buy you know a lot of those um, butterfly plants right there absolutely yeah and even just hiking out in nature you know now's the time of year those everything's coming back to life things are starting to bloom so get out for a hike find your local wilderness area enjoy the outdoors see if you can have a nice encounter with a butterfly um, out in nature and then get inspired to plant some stuff for them in your own backyard. All right. Yes, Great. and Lucas Nursery, home in, in, home in Seminole County, so. Yeah, well, thank you all for joining us and please contact me if you have any other questions. Excellent, thanks for having me, Tia. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.